as we look at the history of our world, the central figure in all of history is a man by the name of Jesus. No matter what anyone says to you, it is a fact. Jesus Christ has had more influence on our world than any other person who has ever lived in history. Why is this the case? Why is his life so fascinating? His teachings are so simple and so beautiful. And yet he influenced the world like no person has ever done in the history of our planet. Why is this the case? I want us to take just a few moments and look at the beauty of Christ. The thing that's so wonderful about Christianity is that the goal of every true Christian is to imitate Jesus. And He's had more influence than anybody that ever lived, and that's our goal. That's why we're here. To imitate Jesus Christ. Paul said it so eloquently in Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and who gave Himself for me. He said, it's no longer I that live, it's Christ living in me. When he wrote to the Galatian congregations in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19, his desire for them was that Christ may be formed in you. God is saying to Christians, My will for your life, my purpose for you being on this earth is not just to have a good time, not just to be entertained. I have a higher purpose. My purpose for you is that Jesus Christ would be formed in your life so that when others see your life, they see the beauty of my dear Son. 1 Peter 2.21 Peter said, Jesus left an example that we should follow in His steps. God's people often sing a song. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior. That's what our life is all about. That's the meaningful purpose we have in life. So many in our world have, they have said they have no meaning in their life. We have the greatest meaning that could ever be for Christ to be seen within our very lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul was contrasting for the Christians in the first century the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And he explains in such a fascinating way how the New Covenant surpasses the Old Covenant. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 8, 6, it's a better covenant because it has better promises. But when Paul looks at it in 2 Corinthians 3, notice his conclusion as he contrasts that old covenant with the new covenant under which we now live. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, 
the last verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, We all with unveiled face behold in a glass or in a mirror the image of the Lord, and we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. That's why we're here today. That's what our life is all about. We look into a mirror. That mirror is the Word of the living God. And as we look in that mirror, we see this image of Jesus Christ. We study what He taught. We notice how He lived. And we are changing our lives. Not all at one time. It's from glory to glory. Doesn't happen overnight. But we are changing our lives into the image of Christ. That's the beauty of Christianity. That's the beauty of the church. That's why the Apostle Paul explained in Philippians, I mean in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, in the church is found the fullness of Christ. Because every member is becoming like Jesus. So it's in the church, in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that we find the fullness of Christ. As we become more like the Savior, we actually partake of the divine nature, Peter would tell us. In Philippians 2, verse 5, we have, verse 5 through 11, we have the most beautiful passage in all of the Bible concerning Christ. But notice how the paragraph begins. Philippians 2, verse 5. Have this mind in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. What's the goal of every Christian? What's the goal of every sincere child of God on the face of this earth? Our goal is to learn how to think like Jesus thought. Our goal is to learn how to behave like Jesus behaved. How do you do this? You study the Scriptures and you find how Jesus thought. What did Jesus think about politics? What did Jesus think about other races? He was not white. He was not Caucasian. He was not an American. How did he look upon other races? How did he look upon other people? How did he look upon people that were different? Because everybody was different than the Savior. How did he look on those people? How did he think? What motivated him? What was the controlling factor in his life? And that's what we want. That's how we want to live. That's how we want to act. How did Jesus talk? In his daily conversations, how did he talk? How did he talk about other people? How do you talk about other people? 
How did Jesus talk about them? How did He look upon sin and inequity and wickedness and rebellion against God? How did He look upon that? How do you look upon it? How did He look upon it? What did He think about the Scriptures? What did He think about God? What did He think about the universe? What do you think? So the Christian life is a beautiful life because every day is another opportunity for us to try and become more like our Savior. What was He really like? What motivated Jesus? We would say in our vernacular, what made Him tick? What motivated Jesus Christ? The answer to that is John 6 and verse 38. John chapter 6 and verse number 38. This motivated every word, every action, every behavior. Everything He did, everything He thought, was motivated by this passage of Scripture. He said, I came down from heaven. The Son of Man came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. John 3 verse 17 says, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God sent Him into this world, and Jesus said, I came here not to do my will, but to do the will of the Father in heaven who sent me to this ungodly place. That motivated every thought He ever had. Everything, every time He talked about another person, that motivate, does that motivate you? When you talk about me, does that motivate you? When you talk about people in this audience, does that motivate you? Everything he thought, everything he did is, the crux of it is right in this passage. In John chapter 4, Jesus and his disciples traveled to Jacob's well. The Bible says Jesus was wearied with his journey. He lived in the flesh. He got tired just like you do. So he's there resting on the well. This woman with a very questionable reputation comes by. Some of you wouldn't even have spoken to her. Because you're so much better. This is a woman of the world. This is a woman in adultery. Some of us wouldn't give her the time of day. She's going to hell. Jesus started to talk to her. And as Jesus began to talk with this woman, she could see this is a Savior. The disciples come back, and nobody asked Him, why are you talking to this woman? Because they knew by then not to ask that question. But they did try to get him to eat some food. They had gone into a city called Sychar to buy Jesus food to eat. He's tired. He's hungry. They're trying to give him food to eat. And Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And they said, well, if somebody brought him something to eat, Look in verse number 34. John 4, 34. Look what Jesus said. My meat, my food, my nourishment, my sustenance is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. That's what keeps me going. That's why I'm here. 
I'm not here just to eat another meal. I'm here to do the work of the Father. Chapter 9. John chapter 9. Look at verse number 4. John 9 verse 4. Jesus said, I must do the works of Him that sent me while it is yet, while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. Jesus is explaining to us we must take advantage of every opportunity to do good things for other people. Because the time is going to come when all the opportunities are gone. Well, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm just not outgoing. Whatever. The time will come when you won't even have the opportunity. I must work the works of Him while it is day. While it, whilst there's an opportunity, while I can, I must do His work because the time is coming when no man can do God's work. Totally dedicated to the will of God. That's what motivated every action, every word of Jesus. And that's what must motivate me. If I'm going to follow Him, He demands dedication. He doesn't demand just come to church and go through five acts of worship and then live as you please the rest of the week and think you're going to heaven. He demands dedication. He demands commitment. Matthew 16, 24, He said, If any man would come after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Me. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 6, 24, He said, No one can serve two masters, either he'll love one and hate the other, hold the one and despise the other. Jesus said, You've got to make up your mind. Are you going to serve this world? Or are you going to serve me? No middle ground when it came to Jesus. You're either serving Him or you're not. It's not, none of this, well, I hope so. You're serving Him, not serving Him. He demands dedication. But He doesn't demand anything that He wasn't willing to do Himself. His entire life was dedicated. Titus 2 and 14. We're to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Two of our members today are in a foreign country. And I can tell you, it's not pleasant over there. You think it's bad in America? You ought to go over there. It's not too pleasant. They're foregoing all the pleasantries that we have in this country to go over there and teach people the Bible. That's exciting. That someone would have this kind of dedication and commitment to go back year after year after year. Dedication, commitment, excitement. That's what Jesus wants. And that's what it means to follow Him. I'm afraid we've just got it all written down. Just go through this, 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 and this. And just be sure you do it like the Bible says. And just go through all these little steps and mark off everything. And, and then we get to go to heaven. Well, be sure you don't miss one of them. 
Don't miss one of those little marks. Oh, my friends, there's far more to Christianity than marking off a little checklist that you've made up. There's far more to living for God than just going through five acts of worship. He wants your whole life. Not just Sundays and Wednesdays. He wants every minute of every day. Not just five acts of worship. He wants your all. He wants your love and your commitment and your dedication and your zeal for His work. He didn't only demand it. He showed us how to do it. He shows us it's not a drudgery. It's a beautiful life. It's a wonderful life. And we, we can't even get some of you to come to worship on a regular basis. Is that not the bare minimum? And some of you think that's too much. Do you not understand Jesus wants your entire life? Jesus doesn't just want you to come to worship. He wants every minute of every day. It's a wondrous challenge. It's a wondrous life. And Jesus shows us how beautiful it is by the life that He lived, by the influence that He left on this world more than anyone has ever left. And so we want to follow Him. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus... And his disciples, a bunch of people following after. Probably because they want a handout. We hadn't changed, have we? Everybody's still got their hand out. Uncle Sam, give it, give it to us. Give it, give it, give it, give it, give it. And we're just about giving to the point there's nothing left to give. We've got to now borrow it from China. People haven't changed. They're following Jesus to get a handout. You don't believe that? Read John chapter 6. So all these people are following Jesus. He goes into this little insignificant city called Nain. And as he goes into the city, a funeral procession is coming by. You've seen them many times. You know when you have to pull over and you're in a hurry because you're already 10 minutes late and you have to pull over and here's all these people coming by with their lights on and you're thinking, well, how many people went to this funeral? When is this going to be over? And so we sit there and we wait patiently. Our foot is tapping. Boy, somebody must have liked this person because this procession's never going to end. Well, here comes this procession and, and they're carrying this man in a casket and his mother is a widow lady. Was it like then like it is now? Widow ladies were usually destitute. Was no social security Often no one would help them, especially if they had no family. So it was a horrible thing for a lady to be a widow in the first century. It's a horrible thing any time, but it was really tough then. Well, this lady lost her husband, but she had a son. And in the Bible, families took care of each other. Now the son is gone. How's this woman going to live? So she's in the procession. 
Jesus walks by. And the Bible says Jesus looked upon this woman. And the Bible says Jesus had compassion. Do you have compassion? Do you even have time to have compassion on anybody? That means to feel with. To feel someone's pain and agony. And Jesus could feel her pain and her agony. And it hurt the Lord. He had compassion upon this widow lady. And he looked upon her and he said, don't cry. She's lost her husband. She's lost her son. How is she even going to get another meal? And this man walks up and says, don't cry. And Jesus raises her son from the dead. Right there out of the casket. Well, this was to prove he was the Son of God. Yes. Yes, it was. But that's not all it was. That's not all it proved. It also proved that he had compassion and love for other people who were hurting. Do you have that? Do you have compassion? Do you look upon compassion as weakness? Was Jesus weak? Created the universe, didn't He? Compassion. It says Jesus had compassion. Do you have compassion? Someone does you wrong. And you just can't understand. Why did they do that? What's wrong with them? But do you have any compassion? Do you even try to understand? Do you even try to understand another person's plight in life and how they are hurting? And how they even, many people, even dread to see another day come. You ever felt like that? No, I never felt like that. Well, try to, try to imagine it. That every day is like a dark cloud. You have no reason to continue. Everything is blackness. There's no hope. You know what those people need? They don't need a kick in the pants. They don't need somebody to get on to them. You know what those folks need? They need the church of Jesus Christ to show a little compassion. To show a little feeling and a little understanding for people we don't understand. Jesus had compassion. How do you develop that? It's not easy. Not in this world. But if we don't, if we don't, we will not be with Jesus in heaven. You can say, I don't understand it, I don't like it, I don't, I don't, I've never understood it, whatever. You better develop it. We all better develop it. Because if we don't learn how to be compassionate toward other people, and patient, and kind, and long-suffering, and forgiving, if we cannot learn that, heaven won't be where we go. Because heaven is not people who have no compassion. Because of the compassion of Jesus, he said to 
a world that was lost. I offer you my life. I will die for you. I will take your rottenness and your ugly sins and I will take them upon myself because I have compassion. You have no chance of heaven, but I will take your sins and I will bear them for you. And all that you must do is accept this wonderful gift that I offer to each one of you. Turn away from your sins. Be immersed into Jesus. And His blood will remove every sin because of His compassion. Do so now while we stand and while we sing.